you have a computer program that checks your new melodies and tells you if they are completely unique and not similar to anything else, this question really made me laugh because there is no melody that is not similar to anything else. If you're studying composition at university and your professors tell you something silly, like you are not allowed to compose music that is similar to the past. Just take no notice and tell them, thank goodness Mozart, Schubert and Richard Strauss didn't have to study with you. I'm Alma Deutscher and I'm continuing to answer the questions you send me about composing and what it's like to be a composer. Many people have asked me questions about originality in melody. So one person asks, how do you know the melody you hear is unique? And someone else asks, how do you ensure your melody doesn't accidentally sound even similar to something that has come before? And lots of people have asked me the same question in different words. Well, to be honest, it has actually happened to me, not once and not twice, that a really beautiful melody of mine was shamelessly stolen by some composer who lived centuries ago. <laughs> but seriously, this is actually a very important question. And I think that many people are a bit confused about what it means for a melody to be original especially people who are being taught composition in university. But I'll come back to that at the end. Actually, a few years ago, I was interviewed by a very nice Italian journalist who asked me lots of very good, intelligent questions. But one of his questions really made me laugh. He asked me, so do you have a computer program that checks your new melodies and tells you if they are completely unique and not similar to anything else. And this question really made me laugh because not only I don't have such a computer program, but there is no melody that is not similar to anything else. Every melody is, to some extent, inspired by melodies that came before and by a musical tradition. Let's think for a moment away from music. Let's take literature, for example. Just imagine how absurd it would be if you asked a novelist, do you have a computer program that tells you if your novel is unique and not similar to anything that came before? Well, just imagine the novelist puts his novel into the computer program and the computer program says, love story. Ah, no, that's, that's been done before, I'm sorry. Or broken heart. It's been done, sorry, no. Or revenge, no, sorry, been done before. Or murder, no, no, that's been done more than once. We all know that there can be a thousand different versions of Romeo and Juliet, and each one can be new and interesting. And it's the same in music. Nothing comes from nowhere. Every melody is inspired by melodies that came before. Even the greatest masterpieces in music. So let me show you a few examples now. Let's start with Schubert, who was famous above all for his beautiful melodies. One of his most popular songs is Heidenröslein. One of Schubert's most iconic melodies. But what would a computer program say about it? Is it really not similar to anything that's come before? Or does it not remind you 
a little bit of this. Schubert takes the beginning of Mozart's melody, note for note. But of course, he doesn't just copy it. He adds his own touch to it. He changes the harmony a bit. Mozart. But since it starts in exactly the same way, if Schubert had had to consult our computer program, he definitely wouldn't have been allowed to write Haydn Rössle. Now, around a century later, Richard Strauss is sitting in his beautiful villa in Garmisch in the Bavarian Alps and composing his new opera, Rosenkavalier. And on the 26th of June, 1909, he writes a letter to his collaborator, Hugo von Hofmannsthal, in Vienna. Dear poet, for the end of the third act, the final duet of Sophie and Octavia, I thought of a really beautiful melody. And he specifies the rhythm and says, perhaps you could think of some really beautiful words. So what was this really beautiful melody that Strauss thought of? It sounds like this. Yes, it really is beautiful. For me, it's one of the most beautiful moments in the whole of opera, if not the most beautiful. But what would our computer program say about that? Does it not sound similar to anything that's come before? Well, just to remind ourselves, Mozart. Like Schubert, Strauss takes the beginning of Mozart's melody from the magic flute, almost note for note. But he also adds his own touch to it. First of all, it's a lot slower. And also he adds this really beautiful ninth suspension. Imagine if Strauss had been suffering under the delusion that his melodies have to be completely different from anything that came before. We wouldn't have had one of the most magical moments in opera. Now, you might think, okay, yes, everyone steals from Mozart, but Mozart himself, ah, that's another story. Mozart was where it all started. 
and his melodies were not similar to anything that came before him. Well, let's take a look. And since we were talking about the magic flute, let's take the despair aria of Pamina in the second act, where she thinks she's been deserted by Tamino. It's in G minor, which is Mozart's most tragic key. And in the end, there's a bit that goes like this. It's a beautiful and moving motif that Mozart lets Pamina sing here. But does it bear no similarity to something that's come before? Well, you might know the three-part inventions by Johann Sebastian Bach. There's one in the key of, hmm, you guessed it, G minor. And also towards the end, there's a bit that sounds like this. It's almost exactly the same. Here's the Bach again. Mozart changes two notes. Mozart knew Bach's keyboard works well. He would play them every Sunday with friends. So he was clearly inspired by this invention. And thank goodness he was. Now, another example from the magic flute. But this one, unfortunately, doesn't put Mozart in such a good light. At least in his attitude to other composers. We all know the overture to the magic flute. the magic flute in the last year of his life, in 1791. But let's go back 10 years to 1781, when he was 25. Mozart and another very famous musician, Clementi, were invited to play at the Imperial Palace for the Emperor Joseph and his royal guests, including the Tsar of Russia. And unbeknownst to the musicians, the Emperor and his guests had placed bets on who they thought would be the more impressive pianist and musician. So they both showed off their compositions and their fast fingers. And Clementi played one of his sonatas in B-flat major, with lots of fast passages in the right hand. And at the end, the emperor rose and declared, probably in order to avoid a diplomatic incident, because, you see, he had bet on Mozart but the Tsar of Russia had bet on Clementi. And so the emperor declared the duel to be undecided. However, Clementi rose and graciously made a gesture to show that in his opinion, Mozart was the winner. Mozart was far less gracious. He was quite annoyed that Clementi could play faster than him. And he wrote a letter to his father, who was back in Salzburg complaining that the piano they gave him was far less good than the piano they gave Clementi. 
his piano was out of tune and had three keys stuck. And he writes, oh, and, and by the way, Clementi hasn't got an ounce of taste or feeling. In other words, a mere technician. Mozart's sister, Nano, who was living with their father back in Salzburg and who was herself an accomplished pianist, must have been intrigued by this virtuoso sonata that Clementi played at the duel. And so she asked Mozart to send her a copy of the music. Mozart obliged, grudgingly, but in his letter to her he added a warning. Everyone who plays or hears Clementi sonatas will feel that they are worthless as compositions. They have no remarkable or striking passages. Oh, except for those in six and octaves. But I'd ask my sister not to waste too much time practicing these, because no one can play them at the speed that Clementi wrote. Not even Clementi himself. Clementi is a charlatan, like all Italians. I know, I've heard him. What he does well, I suppose, are his passages in thirds. Yeah, but that's because he sweated over them day and night in London. And apart from this, he has nothing, absolutely nothing, not the slightest expression or good taste, still less any feeling. So obviously Mozart had a chip on his shoulder when it came to Clementi. Now, what was this worthless sonata in B-flat major that Clementi had played at the duel? Well, it starts like this. Doesn't it sound familiar? Here's the beginning again. And if I play the magic flute in the same key, so although Mozart was at great pains to tell everyone how worthless Clementi Sonata was as a composition, without any striking features, he nevertheless, ten years later, takes Clementi's very striking motifs, note for note, and uses it as the main theme in the overture to the magic flute. In fact, there are more similarities. Clementi, in the development section, turns the theme into minor. surprise also turns the theme into minor. Clementi. And Mozart. Of course, Mozart doesn't just take Clementi's theme. He adds his own genius touch to it. He adds a counter melody. He turns it into a fugue. And this becomes the sublime piece of music that we all know. So quite apart from the fact that Mozart should have been a bit more gracious towards Clementi. Thank goodness Mozart didn't think that his melodies have to be completely dissimilar to anything that came before. There are many more such examples and I'll do some more videos about them. So make sure you subscribe to my channel. And if there are particular examples of composers borrowing from each other that you want me to mention, then you can put them in the comments. So to come back to your question, I know that many young composers today, especially those who study composition in universities, are being told 
that they have to write music that bears no similarity to anything that came before. But the great composers of the past didn't suffer from this delusion. And the masterpieces of classical music are always inspired by earlier melodies. So my advice to all those who've asked me this question and to young composers would be, don't waste your energy on chasing the delusion of a melody that doesn't sound similar to anything that came before. You'll just be killing your creativity. And if you're studying composition at university and your professors tell you something silly, like, you are not allowed to compose music that is similar to the past. Just take no notice and tell them, thank goodness Mozart, Schubert and Richard Strauss didn't have to study with you. If you had taught the great composers, there wouldn't have been any music left. So in short, instead of chasing a delusion, be inspired by the melodies of the past in order to create new beautiful music. Music